Hey everybody, Chuck and Stacy here with VO Buzz Weekly. Overwatch fans, Winston is here. Crispin Freeman. Let's, Let's get, get buzzed. Buzz. Turn it up. Get ready. You're tuned in to VO Buzz Weekly. Weekly. And now, prepare to get seriously buzzed with your hosts, Chuck Duran and Stacy J. Aswan. Guys, our guest is an actor you love in anime, animation, and video games. He is also a sought-after voiceover coach and the creator of the Voice Acting Mastery podcast. You have to check it out. We're so happy to have him with us, finally, and we're getting buzzed with the fabulous Crispin Freeman. Yeah! Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank nice you for to be being here. here. Absolutely. Thanks for having I'm me I'm so today. happy. I always feel like everyone gets here. At the right time. Of course. And Absolutely. you guys have a super fun history. Oh, gosh, yeah. That um, we have to share. As soon as Crispin <laughs> walked in through the door, he said, uh, where's the whale tail? And I'm like, <laughs> what? The whale tail, the Porsche. Because <laughs> yeah. back then, I had this big black Porsche with a giant whale tail. Remember those yeah. 80s whale tails? Yeah. I love so those funny, whale man. tail Porsches. They're yeah. great. So, so good to see you again, yeah. Good man. to see you, too. Wow. So yeah. you guys actually worked on a demo together. Three actually. In 2004 was like kind of. 2004. You had been here a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the first one we ever worked on with was with uh, Joyce Castellanos. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We did a promo mm -hmm. demo, and then I came back later for a commercial demo. Yep. And then I came back for an animation demo. Exactly. So Trifecta. that's right. It's the it's the <laughs> Chuck Duran hat trick. <laughs> Is what that is. Chuck <laughs> oh my Maybe god, your that's yes. Yes, exactly. um, So that's very cool because I mean, you have this beautiful, amazing career that is is just so versatile. Um, well, thank you. Give us, um, give us an idea. Like, kind of take us through. Well, let's do this because everyone's salivating. <laughs> let's just go there right now. I'll okay. Drink some water. Overwatch. <laughs> Overwatch. Right? Overwatch. You are Winston, fabulous Winston in Overwatch. Yes. Um, congratulations on that. Thank you. Such an incredibly juicy character. Yeah. He is. Yeah, Winston, I, I feel very blessed to be able to play Winston. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that tell us a little bit about how that came about and how you got that. Yeah. And so you know, it was interesting. There was there were there was a week actually when I was auditioning for some projects for Blizzard, uh -huh. and uh, they sent over a character called Vindicator Maraud, who was in World of Warcraft. He was in the Warlords of Draenor expansion pack, and he had this big, deep, dark voice with this Eastern European accent. And my family used to smuggle artwork out of Czechoslovakia during the Soviet occupation. And so I have a lot of into that. yes, I have a lot of childhood <laughs> memories. Are of you being supposed in to Prague. say that in public? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, the statute it's, it's of good. limitations <laughs> is over now. So we were like, helping. I say smuggling, but helping. helping. What we were doing is we were helping is, the smugglers. Yeah, no, we were helping the artists okay. because yes. all the artists were abstract painters and sculptors. And when the Soviets cracked down after the Prague Spring and uh, the Jubchek years in '68, none of them were supported by the socialist regime. And so we would smuggle their artwork out to the states and help sell it for them and bring them paint so they could keep working. So we were their distribution arm. So we were sort of nice. going under the radar so Fantastic. that we could help our artists continue doing their art yeah. because the Soviet regime wasn't going to do it. Yeah. Um, so we were smuggling, but for the good guys. Yeah. Um, and, but, but what that meant was a lot of time in Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain as a child listening to Czech accents. And so Eastern European accents were not a problem for me. Mm. So did that. And then literally the, the same week booked another deep voice character, which is Winston. Now, the game didn't have a name yet. It had a code name at the time. And I looked at this character and I said, oh, this is Hank McCoy. This is Beast from X-Men, right? He's blue, he's smart, he wears glasses. He probably says, oh, my stars and garters. Like, you know, he's, he's yeah, totally yeah. Beast. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and I said, I, I have a feeling what people are going to do with this guy is they're going to try to do Grodd. They're going to try to do this big, deep, scary gorilla. But he's not a scary gorilla. He's a scientist gorilla, right? And so I did my best sort of gorilla, and they cast me as both these deep voice characters like the same week. And I was nice. like, that's weird. I mean, <laughs> I'm a big boy Yeah, now. I guess I'm a big boy now. <laughs> and so we, we go in to do this, this character, and um, the original thing we were recording was what's known as the cinematic trailer. It was the first trailer. It was the first thing that Blizzard released at, uh, at BlizzCon. I think it was 2015. 
And so I had like four or five lines, and the character puts it, pulls his glasses up, and I, I have big chunky glasses that I usually wear in the studio, yeah. and they look just like Winston's glasses, it just kismet. And so they said, the animators like, can, can you just push your glasses up, and we'll get some video reference of it, because we need it for the animation. I was like, sure, sure. So I pushed my glasses up, and then when I saw the animation, I was like, that is how I push my that's, glasses up. Ah, that's awesome. Um, but uh, so we did, we did the lines and everything, and it came back to do some pickups for fighting noises and everything. And then I'm at BlizzCon, I believe it was 2015, when uh, when we're doing Warlords of Draenor, and I'm there for Vindicator Maraud, we're promoting Warlords of Draenor, yeah. World of Warcraft. We'll go backstage in the green room, and there's a little screen that shows what's playing on the big screen. And so we're waiting, and this thing starts playing on the screen that looks like a Pixar film. Like, it doesn't look like anything I've ever right. seen Blizzard do before. Right. When they told us when we were working on it, they said it's a sci-fi thing, so I'm thinking it's gonna be like StarCraft, and it's gonna be dark and gritty, and this thing shows up, looks like a Pixar film, and I'm like, what is that? Oh, there's a gorilla. Wait a minute, I play a gorilla? Wait, is that me? What is this, Overdrive, Overclock? What is this game? Like, I had no idea what the, wow. what the game was called. It was so under wraps because they were so frightened right. that maybe it might not do well, because mm -hmm. I don't know if you know, but they had been working on another project called Titan that had sort of failed spectacularly. Mm. So yeah. they were really nervous about Overwatch, yeah. and they really wanted to, to come out well. So once that came out, I was like, I, I'm the gorilla, oh my god, you know? And it literally took another year before I realized how important Winston was to the world of Overwatch. Wow. That he's sort of the Rolodex. He's the nexus point that all the other characters go through. And we were literally recording like scene after scene. And I'm the opening video on the game. Yeah. And I assumed all the other voice actors were doing the same thing. Like, uh, you know, they were doing shorts for every character. And they, they probably will. Like, it's been years now. And right. slowly but surely, right. more characters' shorts are coming out. But back then, I was like, oh, so there's going to be a Tracer short, right? They're like, no, we don't really have a Tracer short. Oh, we have a, a short for this? No, no. Just for me? <laughs> Yeah. Wait a minute, I'm really important, aren't I? They're like, yeah, you are. Yeah. I'm like, where are you guys gonna tell me? Like, I had no idea. That's so awesome. it was sort of this slow realization. I think, I think what was astounding about Overwatch and why I got so excited about it was that it, for the first time, it was a game that was so incredibly idealistic, heroic, optimistic, that, 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 that so much of the game world was so dark and gritty and real, yeah. and it was all about, you know, brunettes in 35 with Stubble as the main <laughs> character, and you're like, okay, I get yeah. it. You all want to be Han Solo. I'm, I'm sorry you're not Han Solo, thanks, thanks, but like, Kristen. you know, get over it. And, and, and so, it's like a page out of my journal. And, thanks. And, and, and Overwatch, uh, Blizzard made a point of this. You know, they said, we're going to make a first person shooter game, and we're going to put a woman on the cover. Mm -hmm. You know, they put Tracer on the cover. Like, they, they, they were very conscious about saying, we're going to subvert all this ridiculous testosterone that has been going on. And on top of that, well, not only are we gonna include, you know, all sorts of female characters, but they're gonna be from all over the world. Yes. Like, we're gonna have international characters from yep. everywhere. And when they, yes. after the cinematic trailer, the next trailer they released was a gameplay trailer, where you could actually see what the game looked like in yeah. real time. Yeah. And you had sort of one team, and the team that my character was on, Winston, it was like four women, a gorilla, and a robot. And I was like, this game is awesome, <laughs> right? Like, this is amazing. Yeah. And so, I got, uh, for the very first time I saw that cinematic trailer, because I, I couldn't really see it at the con, because it was too noisy. Yeah. I really went home, found it on YouTube, watched it. I literally started crying. Like, I, I teared up. Wow. Because when, when Tracer turns to the little kid and said, you know, the world could use a few more heroes. And I was like, ah. I you know, know. And, and, and even now, when I go into record, if I hear Tracer's voice, I have to be like, can I have a minute? <clears throat> okay, I'm back. So yeah. it, it can be, yeah. it, it, that's, that's how much it touches me. That's Do you really think that cool, that's man. what really resonates with the fans? Is that sort of hopefulness of it? I think so. I think that there are many people who are so who identify with it so much because it has such a broad spectrum of character archetypes mm -hmm. and because it has such an uplifting message. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're at conventions and you're on the Overwatch panels and you're you're getting questions from the fans, what's kind of the underlying question or curiosity that they have about your character or about the process of the game? Yeah, I think the biggest question they have is what kind of peanut butter do I like, crunchy or creamy? <laughs> <laughs> That's usually the first question. Uh, and the answer is crunchy, yes, crunchy. Thank yeah. you very much, crunchy. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, I think, empowering things about any kind of storytelling, and especially in the world of fantasy and sci-fi storytelling, is this idea of representation. It's so important, I think, for an audience member to see themselves in a heroic position. I think that's why we, why uh, a film like Black Panther is so important. Uh, when I was growing up, 
I was looking for those character archetypes to model myself after. And many of them were way too macho for me. Like, I, I just, I wasn't those kinds of characters until I found uh, The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And then I saw elves, and I went, aha, elves! <laughs> right. That, you know, running yeah. around, dancing about in the woods with a bow and arrow, that's me. You're like, yeah. I, I get it, yeah. right? And so I, I always had Middle Earth, which was this fictional place that I could explore my psyche in. Mm -hmm. And for so long, African Americans ha have not had something like that. Well, now yes. they have Wakanda, right? They c I had Middle Earth, they have Wakanda. Awesome, right? Yeah. I mean, everyone yeah. should have that. And so I think what's so powerful about Overwatch is this sort of one-two punch of having the optimism, the idealism, this aspirational quality, and at the same time, the broadness of character archetypes, so that there's so many there's so many characters you can identify with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm friends with uh, Anjali Bimani, who plays Symmetra, yeah. and yeah. she's sort of become a little bit of a den mother for all of us in the Overwatch world. And uh, because uh, Symmetra is on the autism spectrum, there's so many fans that immediately identify with her because of that, mm -hmm. and that's really powerful. Um, I identified with Winston because of his idealism. If if uh, if you had said like today they said you know we haven't cast any of the Overwatch characters you know here are the twenty five characters you have or however many there are now you can have your pick who would you choose I would choose Winston every time mm, yeah. and and the fact that that happened completely uh, synchronistically yeah um, was sort of magic but also destiny because that's who I am. And yes. so there's this wonderful scene in Winston's short where Dr. Harold Winston brings him to the observatory and opens the gates and you can see they're standing on the moon and you can see the earth. And he says, you know, always see the world as it could be, right? Mm -hmm. Never, you know, mm -hmm. always aspire to this sort of greater ideal of how things could be. And I'm just like, well, yes, doctor, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and that is often how I have felt in my life as a sort of space elf. I've always sort of looked at other humans and go, well, we have these ideals, right? We can we can live up to these ideals, can't we? Can't can mm -hmm. we? Can we? Yeah. No, you, yeah. you don't want to live up to the ideals, but well, but why? Wouldn't everything be better if yeah, we lived yeah, up to the ideals? Yeah. Um, and so there's this sort of uh, indefatigable optimism about Winston that I identify with. Yeah. Um, and there's other characters who've had that ideal and have been disillusioned, like Soldier Seventy Six. You know, he yep. used to be sort of a Captain America type, and now he's become embittered. And right. I understand that too, but Winston's like, no, I will not no. have it. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. gotta be. No, I will not have we, it. We, you know, there's, there, there are. He there shares are, his peanut butter. Yes, there are wonderful <laughs> principles that we should oh be able to God. live up to, and yes. why not? Wait, That's so that cool, good? man. It's I so, mean, why not exactly, and what's the worst that could happen? I know. Goodness it's so in good. The world, right? It's so good to hear you be so into like a character and a job, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. like, it's really, really neat. Yeah. Um, do you still audition for work? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's yes. exactly okay. Good. That's what I wanted to hear. Um, no, I love. I love when I ask voice actors that because they all spit like, their water out. Yeah. Um, why don't you share with our fans out there, your fans out there, that are people that might be aspiring to get into this business? What are some of your uh, what's your formula on on auditioning, particularly like maybe taking a character and bringing it to life during an, audi an audition? I think that. Um, when I'm approaching uh, a character, and it's funny actually because I, I get asked this a lot in my classes when I teach it, and I actually developed an entire class on it called my audition analysis class because it, it, it happens so fast in my head, and my students be like, "How do you do that?" And I'd be like, "How do I do that?" Right? And so I had yeah. to sort of sit down and, and put it in steps, and and in the class I, I uh, expound on it in more detail. But basically, what I'm trying to do is find the psychological center of the character. What is it that makes this character tick? What's their itch that they need to scratch. Yeah. Okay. And if I can feel like I can get a handle on that, like with Winston, I'm like, oh, he's like Beast. And so I'm not going to do him as this big scary gorilla. I'm going to do a sort of Patrick Warburton. Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. You know, you know, like it, it's it, it's sort of the big lovable guy, but who's really smart and, and can get things done. Oh, these spinach puffs are amazing. You know, and 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 so a lot of what I'm doing as Winston is sort of inspired by a Patrick Warburton, Bill mm -hmm. Fogerbachy sort of sensibility. Yeah. And, and, and so often when I'm teaching my students, I say, you don't, I mean, we talk about being the person, the actor of a thousand voices. Mm, you really need to be the actor of a thousand psychologies. Because mm -hmm. if you can understand the psychology of what makes the character tick, that's what's going to get you 
the role. That's most of the big role. Because Lord knows, Winston has a deep voice. There are plenty of voice actors in LA who have deeper voices than oh, me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's because I understand his psychology that I, I think they chose me for him. And that's happened to me multiple times over my career where it's because of my psychological understanding. So that's usually what I'm going for. And so I'm looking at the script that I have in front of me like a paleontologist, okay? Yeah. All I've got is one tooth and they want me to reconstruct the entire T-Rex <laughs> yes. from that one tooth, yes. right? That is completely unfair. <laughs> Welcome to the industry, <laughs> yeah. right. you know? Right. And so the only way that I know how to do that is by seeing so many dinosaur skeletons that you can just recognize that tooth in an instant. Mm -hmm. Right. And so you fill out the rest and then maybe you tailor a little something here or there for the specificity of this scene. You know, Winston is not Hank McCoy. He is something different and yeah. so he needs to have a slightly different spin on him. The, the, the placement of the voice then is, is a sauce that gets put on top of that. Right. You know, so I could understand where Winston is coming from, but I can't make it sound like this because that's not gonna work as a big gorilla, right? right. And so I have to say, okay, he's gotta be in lower register, but that's all technical uh, modifications. That's all spoilers and air dams yeah. on, right. on top right. of the car that has to run. The engine yeah. of the car is the psychology. Yeah. So that I'm, 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 a, I'm a detective, I'm a paleontologist trying to glean as much detail from the little scraps of information I get mm -hmm. and then roll with it. And, and the other thing is that I'm trying to find that character in me. I think many people think that building a character is something that you construct externally to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And the yeah. problem is if you do that, what you've done is you made a really good sock puppet. And if you throw a pie at that sock puppet, that's not funny, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're the character and you throw the pie and it lands on my face, now that's funny. That's very right? funny. And yeah. so I think what people misunderstand is that they think, oh, I have to build a character. And then you've got this automaton that doesn't feel believable. Yeah. No, 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 no. The character's in you somewhere. Part of being a human being is you get a universe inside of you. And so you have to give yourself permission for the part of you that, that lines up with this character to come out and play. Love it. And that can so be true. tricky because sometimes we won't give ourselves permission to be that angry, that merciless, that whatever. Yeah. Or you're so or you're so married to the specs and you're thinking, well, my instinct is saying this feels right, but the spec is saying you know, yes. so how much do you honor the specs? You do the classic, you know, give them one take of what they're asking for and one take of what they actually want. Yeah. Because often they don't know how to articulate what they want. And right. the yes. classic rule in Hollywood is give them what they want, not what they ask for. Because mm -hmm. very rarely do they know how to ask for what they want. And right. so there is a little bit of mind reading there. And the only way you do that is by seeing so many skeletons, so many dinosaur skeletons, that you, you sort of go, oh, I think I know where you're going. Mm -hmm. I, it's like this, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, yeah, how did you know? Mm. Yeah. What, right, exactly. Well, and obviously, I mean, you have a, a large body of work and years of experience. But also, I mean, for those people who don't have decades in the industry, I mean, watching things and listening and looking at what's out there is also a way to build that kind of... I call it active experience. listening yeah. or active watching. So when you go to a restaurant, you may eat a meal and you might say, this is good, this is bad. That's not how a chef eats at a restaurant. A chef goes, is that cilantro? Like they can't stop thinking yes. about how it's Dissecting put together. It, yeah. So it's what you have to do yeah. is you have to watch the content that you love and say, yeah, but how do they put that together? Or even better, I don't like this. How would you fix it? Right. Right? If there's some sci-fi or fantasy movie, you think, oh, that's not the way it should have been. Okay, great. You think it yeah. should be better? Fix it. Fix How it. would you fix it? Uh-huh. Uh, okay, now you're an artist, not just a critic. An artist, exactly. now a critic says, that's bad. An artist says, how do we fix it? Yes. I love that. Yeah. So voice acting mastery, you mm -hmm. started in 2011, right? Yes, yes, that sounds right. Yes, right. I think summer of 2011. Um, <laughs> yes, well it is now. It's been, it's been uh, a while. Gonna say, it is now. <laughs> it was a good year when the video it came was a bad in. Year. Um, Quite. So what was it that inspired you to want to create this podcast and to teach? I think voice acting mastery came because of what I was experiencing at conventions. So I would go to conventions and fans would ask questions and the most common question they would ask is, how do I become a voice actor? Yes. It's a great question to ask. It's a really complicated question to answer, mm -hmm. especially in a sound bite at a convention when I've got two minutes or 30 seconds to answer, right? right. The best I can come up with is some pithy response like, know thyself, you know, which is right. now I sound like the Oracle at Delphi. <laughs> and, you know, Have you ever used it? Oh yeah, I'm sure that. No, build thyself. Get in touch with your feelings. <laughs> um, and and so while I may now sound like you know the Oracle from the Matrix, um, it, it, and while that may be true, 
it's not actionable. You can't go right. home and practice that. I'm knowing myself. I'm knowing myself. And then that doesn't work, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and as my students know, I hate fluffy bunny actor talk. It's just utterly useless to me. So I always want to give practical help. And I realize there's no way I can actually give practical help answering questions at a convention. It, this has to be a longer form process. And so I thought, well, I have this booth at home and I know how to record myself. <laughs> Got my fancy equipment. Why not, you know? Yeah. And so I thought, well, let me, try this, let me try this podcasting thing and see how that works. Mm -hmm. And so um, I started building the website and making the podcast as a way to share that information with as many people as possible. Um, and I was, I, at the time I was teaching classes in LA, so it was a way to sort of let people know what I was about, and mm -hmm. if they wanted to know what my philosophy was as a teacher, they could get a, a taste of me before they came to get class. And of course, what I should have known was there was this huge international audience for this stuff because the yes. podcast not just distributed in California, it's right, distributed right. all over the world. Yes. And so then I was like, oh, I need to start doing online classes. And that's when I started offering online classes. And I've had right. students from, the UK, from Australia, from Japan, from New Zealand, from from the Middle East. I mean, it's, it's yep. amazing. Yeah. Um, and so that was my way to try to share with the fans and with aspiring artists the actual practical things you need to do in order to become a professional. Right. Because too often what happens is people will share platitudes, right, which is the know thyself, and not sort of the practical nuts and bolts and the reali realistic expectations of what the industry is gonna require of you if you're actually gonna do this. Right. This is a profession, and it is competitive, and it is awesome if you know what you're doing, and right. it is horrible if, if you, you get don't. dropped yeah. in, the, <laughs> yeah. in the pond with sharks yeah. and they're all gonna eat you. It's like the riptide, you're just, yeah. Yeah, you exactly. just forget it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so this was my way of trying to share with them uh, what it was actually gonna take to work in the industry. When I go to a convention, as soon as I get up on stage to answer questions, I say, look, there's two, I'll, I'll talk about whatever you want, um, and I'll be your human jukebox if you want, although, you know, you could always play the DVD, but I get it, I'll, I'll be your human jukebox. But there are two topics that I like to discuss most. One is, how do I work as a professional in the industry? Mm -hmm. In whatever uh, capacity, whether it be a director, writer, voice actor, you know, designer, whatever. Um, and also, uh, why do we love these stories so much? And that's where my mythology scholarship yes. comes in, in trying to explore that aspect of what's going on. And for me, that also informs my uh, professional artistry. But those are the two most useful and uplifting conversations I like to have with aspiring uh, uh, artists or fans because I feel like then you can go home and chew on that and do something mm -hmm. and it exactly. will either yes. improve your career or your life or both and yes. wouldn't it isn't I mean that was why I watched these this content it's why I got into animation and sci-fi and fantasy yeah. is because there was wisdom in these stories and in these characters that I was trying to internalize mm -hmm. so um, no it's a great podcast voiceactingmastery.com you guys check it out yeah. and you also bring guests on that you, you the conversation is really it's really juicy. I mean yeah and like you said yeah <laughs> ju juicy's my word today I don't know why it's today's juicy, word is baby. juicy sponsored by juicy fruit I don't know yeah um but I like it because you're you're not just pulling out. Follow your dreams, everyone. Everyone can do it. Just go ahead. And yeah, yeah. I mean, follow your dreams, but do so responsibly. Absolutely. Right. You don't just jump off a cliff. You you. If you want to get into hang gliding, you have to get the right equipment and know how to check it and make sure it works and get your training and everything. And then when you go, you can actually soar. Yes. But otherwise, if you just jump off and you don't know what you're doing, you're in for a hard landing, and that's no fun at all. Absolutely. Right. Um. And and I think that 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 I I think uh, p people who uh, I, you do a disservice to people when you don't explain the practicality of it because you, you have to accept what needs to be done on the back end to have the, quote, glamour of what's on yeah. the front right. end. Right, because and, you know, people are going to conventions, they're going to premieres, and they're seeing, they're seeing the actors, you know, in their glory, and there's lines, and there's pictures, and it's, but let us not forget, you know, the, the classic overnight success that took 10 years, you know, that the, the work and the diligence and the persistence that, and the sacrifice that goes into reaching if you're doing this level. for celebrity, then you are a slave to popular opinion. 
This is not a happy way to go through life. And you're not going to make a lot of dough. No, because <laughs> you're, that, that means that your satisfaction in life is completely, completely dependent on how other people think of you. Mm -hmm. Blech! Right? Yeah. That's horrible. That is horrible. But rather say, no, 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 I just like this process. This process and making this. So when I fell in love with acting, because I was a very shy kid. I'm an introvert. I'm not an extrovert. I don't need to be around a lot of people. I'm happy staying at home, petting my cat like a Bond villain. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, you know, it's, it's almost a little weird that I got into this acting thing where I get up on stage. And, and when I was young, my family was heavily involved with the opera. My, my grandfather sponsored a lot of operas at Chicago and had all the cast parties at his house and commissioned all the critical editions of Verdi's operas. And so as a child, I was around all these opera singers and they scared the hell out of me because they had these huge voices. Yeah. And um, they always wanted me to be a kid in the opera. And I was just like, no way, I'm not doing, I'm way too shy, way too scared. Somehow in like middle school, I was like sixth grade, they finally convinced me to try it. And so I went backstage at the opera, and the opera house backstage is a city. I don't know if you've ever been backstage. Yeah, at my opera first house. jobs were dancing in operas. Okay, there you dancer. go. Yeah. Right, so you, it's so it's so big back there. You understand why the Phantom can hide because yes. it's a city. Yes. And so there'd be this elevator, and these people would get off the street, go up the elevator, come back down, and they look like Henry VIII. And I was like, that is so cool, right? And so I fell in love with the creation of the illusion for the audience, right? I fell right. in love with, oh, isn't this cool? Yeah, there's people out there applauding. That's nice, good. I'm glad they're loving it, but I'm not doing this for the them. The world that's happening around I'm you. I'm doing this for the story, for my fellow creators. We're making this cool thing, and if and if we want it to communicate, we always want to make sure we're connecting with the audience, but I'm not doing it for the likes. Right. If you're getting into voice acting for the likes, Get on Instagram. Like, you're in the wrong... It's too hard, man. <laughs> yeah. It is, man. Yeah. Hey, I have a question so for true. you. So true, so true. So, when teaching students, mm -hmm. would you rather somebody already have some training under their hat, if you will, or do you work with people that are just really just thinking about starting to get started? I mean, how... Do, are you... A, you know, all levels or just strictly Yeah, I'm, will, I'm willing to work with all levels. Okay. Um, I've had people who come in with no training, but they have good instincts. Good instincts. And so hopefully what I'm doing is I'm planting the conceptual ideas that will help them avoid bad teachers in the future. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of teachers who teach and they like to hear themselves talk, and none of their teaching is tested by the marketplace. Yeah. Right? It's Amen, like, uh, you've got great theory, yeah. but does that get you hired? Yeah. Does that yeah. get you paid? And so I like theory too. Lord knows I am totally overtrained. I've gone to grad school and I've trained all over the world and that's wonderful, but I still had to have my butt handed to me when I came to LA. It's like, yeah, you're cute with your theory, kid. Now, do you wanna, you wanna get something done here or yeah. what's going on? And I'm like, okay. Now I, I've drawn all my training and experience to help me be uh, competitive in the marketplace, but the marketplace decides. And so if you can't give someone the training they need to compete in the marketplace, then they're a starving actor, and that seems silly. Mm. Um, there are certainly people who come who do have training, happy to work with them too. Yeah. Sometimes we have to help them get undo, past undo. certain blocks, because yeah. there's usually something they do that's good, right? If yeah. they've had some training and they've gotten some progress, there's something that they're doing that's good. Yeah. Mm. But just like any athlete who might have developed a bad habit, like they're really good at layups, but their free throws suck, you know, you have to go, okay, are you willing to be honest enough with yourself to say, this is your strong suit and this is a weak point? Yeah. Are you willing to deal with that weak point? Yeah. And for me, it's more about the honesty. It's more about being, because I've had people go, no, I don't have that problem. Okay, you tell me when you get hired. Like, you know, like it's not gonna happen, my friend. Yeah. Um, is, is, there, yeah. is there a most common mm. obstacle or issue that, you know, somebody trying to get started uh, is the hardest, to, or, or that you deal with the most, that it's hard to overcome for? for... Well, I think there's, there's probably two. One, especially when it comes to voice acting, yeah. is that somehow voice acting does not require you to get up in front of other people. Mm. That if someone is shy, or someone is nervous, or doesn't like the way they look, I can become a voice actor, and then no one has to look at me, and I don't have to get up in front of people, I don't have to embarrass myself. Mm. Bullpucky. <laughs> right. All right. It, it is. I have found it far easier to become an actor and to learn how to act in theater than in voice acting. Because in theater, you have the set, you have the costumes. If you're trying to play pretend, you've got all this stuff helping you play pretend. Yeah. You have your fellow actors to hang on to and to learn from. Right. And and you have weeks of rehearsal, hopefully, to get better at it. As a voice actor, you are isolated in a fishbowl with a bunch of producers going. 
Right. Yep. Right? Sometimes is, you have minutes to prepare. It is so yeah. it is a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is so much more pressure. They're voice listening acting. to every syllable that right, you are saying. Right. God. Yeah. And right. they'll they'll be, you know, they'll go, uh, great, can we have another one? And you do it and they go, thanks, and they go. And you have no idea what they're saying. Yes. And your brain goes to yes. horrible places. Yes. Right? So you have to have so much more self-esteem mm -hmm. and confidence as a voice actor than you would as a theater actor, especially right. when you're first starting out. Right. And so this notion, I really want to disabuse anyone of this notion <laughs> that somehow voice <laughs> acting is easier than other types of acting. Oh, hell no, it is not. Yes. Right? Yes. You have to be a ninja yeah. because these people will eat your lunch. They will. Have you heard what these guys and these women can do with their voices? Yeah. My God, right? Yeah. So the, I think that's usually one of the biggest uh, misconceptions mm -hmm that people mm. need to get over. Why, why do you think that you're an effective teacher? I think you are, in case you didn't know. Well, thank you, that's kind of <laughs> it. I, I think, just like, word on the street is you are, so just telling you. I think I'm an effective teacher because I am willing to put into a conceptual framework what I have learned to do instinctively. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of people who are really good cooks and they just sort of wing it in the kitchen. Yep. And they're frustrating to try to learn from because they, they have what we call the curse of expertise. Mm -hmm. They're mm. so good at it that they've forgotten what it's like to be a beginner. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. Um, and so I think what, what is important to me is I do my best to remember what it was like when I was a neophyte and I didn't know what I was doing. And I understand the importance of having really clear conceptual frameworks, really clear definitions. So like one of the things that people talk about in acting all the time is this, this idea of being in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. and, and what does that mean? Quick, be in the moment. Now don't be in the moment. <laughs> it's worthless, <laughs> right? Good. right? It doesn't, it doesn't yeah. actually mean anything. Yeah. And so what I try to do is I try to take something like that where someone's gesturing at something that means something, but they're being really sloppy in their words, right? And yeah. I don't know if it's like the sort of Greek philosopher in me or something. is like, no, we've got to define our terms. And so I say, being in the moment means that you are not anticipating where the scene is going to go. Uh -huh. Too often when actors look at a scene, they break it down like an obstacle course. I'm going to do this, do this, I'm going to say this word this way, that way, this way, this, and then I'm going to do a triple gainer, boom, 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 and then I'm done and I get a gold star, right? Yeah. No, because that's not how we go through life. That'd be like, right. I'm going to drive here to the studio, and I'm going to get in this lane, I'm going to drive for 500 yards, and then I'm going to change lanes at this point. No, you're going to crash. Like, it's not going to work. Yeah. Being in the moment means that you're not anticipating what's happening. You're actually responding as it's coming at you. Mm -hmm. And so people go, oh, okay, that's... So if every time I'm talking to my students, I'm trying to say there are practical things. So like when we're talking about letting a character out of you, usually it's one of two problems. One, it's permission. You haven't yeah. given yourself permission to do that. Or it's a lack of familiarity. Often when I'm working with American students, they don't know how to play royalty because they have no experience right. with the royal family, right? Mm -hmm. And so they just do uh, uh, rich snob. Accent, That's yeah. a complete caricature of... of, of it, yes, it really is. Yeah, it's just yes. a character. Yeah, yeah, there's some royalty that's rich snob and some that yeah. aren't, right? And so if you're going to play Aragorn in Lord of the Rings, he's a royalty. He is not a rich snob, right? But if that's all you think, you've got no chance. Mm -hmm. So that's it's one of those two things. And they go, really? Yeah, really. It's usually one of those two things. Yeah. Now you have something practical to go home. It's not just, oh, feel it. Feel yourself. Like, it does. that doesn't help. Like, yeah. have fun with it. Go have fun with yourself. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's pointless. So good, not helpful. So good. So good. So good. Well, that concludes part one with Crispin Freeman. Join us next week for part two. Yes, and show us some love in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe. We love you guys. Thanks for watching, and just remember, you, you always, always have, have time, time for, for a little buzz. buzz. Buzz Weekly is sponsored by Chuck Duran's Demo That Rock. Rock. The voiceover demo producer to the stars is now available to you. Visit DemosThatRock.com and take your voiceover career to the next level. See you next time. And remember, you always have time for a little buzz.